Did an advanced ancient civilization vanish from South Africa because of the Great Flood? Were modern humans created through genetic manipulation to mine gold for the ancient gods? Did humanity inherit its obsession for gold from these ancient gods? What are the secrets of the substance known as monoatomic gold? Join us for this episode of Gaia's original series, Hidden Origins, featuring Michael Tellinger as he answers these questions and presents evidence in support of Zachariah Sitchin's research into the Anunnaki Earth mission to procure gold and save their home world. Hello, this is Michael Tellinger, and we continue our exploration into the ancient past, the murky origins of humankind and our species on this planet, to see what we can learn from the ancient civilizations and the wisdom of the ancients that can benefit us into the future of humanity and this planet of ours. The last episode we ended off with exposing the more than 10 million mysterious stone structures scattered throughout Southern Africa. And that is clearly a very large number of stone structures and a very definite indication that we're dealing with a vanished civilization that we know very little about. The big question is, what happened to them? And why are so few of these structures visible today? It's obvious that something happened that stopped the civilization from doing whatever it is they were doing. And we find the evidence of this in the Sumerian texts. It's fascinating. When we ask the question, what happened? Normally, as usual, we find the Sumerian texts and the ancient civilizations and the ancient texts give us clear indications of what happened in the past. These are two examples of what are referred to as the Sumerian kings lists. A number of these kings lists have been found. These two of particular interest because they were found at different places at different times, and yet they contain exactly the same information. The one, the larger one, obviously contains more information than the smaller one, but yet they contain the, the core of the information is the same. And they basically tell us about a long period of time that spans more than 220,000 years and cites a number of kings, the same kings by name and by region that ruled the world. It also tells us that these kings were appointed by the gods in a statement that says that kingship was lowered to earth from heaven or after kingship descended from heaven. And uh, so we realize that this is most likely the beginning of the royal bloodlines on planet Earth when some of the humans were chosen by the gods to rule over the rest of humanity. And this is a very critical point in our human history that we're going to come back to when we start analyzing the origins of money and the control of the planet through the system, the monetary system that has enslaved all of us today. What we find fascinating is that this information is not only about the kings that ruled the world that were given advanced technology and advanced weapons with which they could smite and control the humans. They were given knowledge of alchemy and sorcery and wizardry and all kinds of other things that we could not possibly even imagine today because clearly they had to take control over humanity. One of the key things that we read in these two particular tablets is, at the end of it, it says, and then the flood swept over. And I believe that this is what happened to this vanished civilization at the southern tip of Africa. And if a picture can tell a thousand words, then we can see from some of these aerial photographs that a vast majority of this vanished civilization in southern Africa is covered by large amounts of sediment and sea sand. In front of Adam's calendar, for example, in the Barberton Valley, we have up to about 30 meters of sea sand sediment. We have found sea shells and fossilized fish on tops of mountains inside of the stone circle walls that indicates that a large amount of seawater 
and um, see life came across and somehow at some stage covered this whole part of the southern part of southern Africa. And this brings us to the Sumerian connection. And we discover that there is, as there is with most parts of this planet, a very clear and distinct connection between the Sumerian civilization, the Sumerian tablets, and the civilizations of Southern Africa. And this is well encoded in the ancient knowledge keepers or, and kept by the ancient knowledge keepers of Southern Africa, like Baba Kredo Mutwa, for example, who speaks volumes about the Anunnaki and the Sumerians and the influence of the Sumerian and the Sumerian culture on the people of Southern Africa and the interconnectedness of these civilizations on top of each other. And this is where we meet the Anuna gods, or the Anunnaki, as the Sumerian texts refer to them. And we meet Anu, Enlil, and Enki, what could be described as the Sumerian Holy Trinity. And we got to ask ourselves, well, what is all this activity in Southern Africa about? And as always, as we've mentioned before, it's always about the gold. We cannot separate our origins and our history from our obsession with gold. But I have to point out at this point that whenever the, the explorers from Europe, or should we call them the conquerors, not necessarily explorers, or sometimes I refer to them as the thugs from Europe, because that's really what they were doing, just invading the rest of the world and claiming it as their own. When they started invading the free world about 500 years ago, the one strange phenomenon that they found, the native people that they invaded, had no money, they had no jails, and they had a completely different belief system from what they explored or what they were introduced to in Europe. What they found was a huge amount of gold. All these ancient cultures seemed to have a lot of gold, but they always told them that the gold doesn't belong to us. The gold belongs to the gods. And therefore, we realize that the Anunnaki were in charge of this vast gold mining empire on planet Earth, and the gold always belonged to them. Remember that the old money in ancient times was never gold. Gold coins were just minted for special occasions. Money in ancient times was always silver, or more often than not, silver, in between other ways of trading and exchanging things. So the gold always belonged to the gods, and only on special occasions would they mint golden coins. And it's from that obsession for the gold by the gods that we inherit our obsession because humans were never allowed to have the gold. So when we landed a piece of gold or when we were granted or given a piece of gold by the gods, it became a very prized possession and something that everyone would be envious about and we would hang it around our necks and wear it as jewelry and ornamental kind of um, things that would be envied by everyone else. And this is where our obsession with gold comes from, most likely from this period in human history. So the ancient history of Southern Africa is all about the gold, but there's a more recent history that we can explore as well. We read in the Sumerian tablets that the Anunnaki explored the gold in this place called the Abzu. And there's a specific translation that we get from Zachariah Sitchin. Now remember that Zachariah Sitchin didn't know anything about the large number of stone ruins in Southern Africa. He extracted most of his information from the Sumerian texts. So what we present here in this series is a lot of physical evidence for much of Zachariah Sitchin's research and his lifelong study of the Sumerian texts. What we find in this particular translation is quite staggering because it tells us about the Abzu as being the place of gold. It says, where the landmass, the shape of a heart was given, in the lower part thereof, golden veins from earth's innards were abundant. Abzu, of gold the birthplace, Ea to the region the name gave, Ea being Enki, the same individual. And so we move on to what we can call the golden surprise. Because what we'll find, and this is a very important thing for us to digest, the Anunnaki were not interested in the shiny metallic form of gold. This is where our obsession comes from. But the Anunnaki and the gods were interested in the white powder of gold or the monoatomic form of gold. Much research has been done in 
pretty much in hidden laboratories around the world, but the secret government projects and the, and the secret uh, research laboratories know a lot about this. But one individual um, in Phoenix, Arizona, by the name of David Hudson, did some phenomenal research with this thing called the white powder of gold. And he's one of the few civilians that really knows what's going on with this substance. When we talk about monoatomic gold, because this is ultimately what the Anunnaki were obsessed with. Gold in its monoatomic form, sometimes referred to as orm, orbitally rearranged monoatomic elements, as David Hudson called it. Now, when you take a golden atom, which is AU1, so it means that a, the, the golden atom has an, an orbit on the outside uh, that has only got one electron in it. So to complete the bond, it needs another electron. So what it does, it binds to itself. So a, a, a golden atom is always AU2. So it's a stable golden atom. But if you prevent the golden atom from binding to itself, it remains in a white fluffy form. And it remains in a white fluffy powderous state that, that has no metallic properties. It defies gravity. It does very strange things that defies pretty much everything we understand in the laws of physics today. It levitates. Uh, some of the things that David Hudson um, shared with me in the many discussions that I had with him was that while they were doing the research in the MIT laboratories for about two or three years, um, and none of this was documented because remember that mainstream scientific laboratories will not publish papers or document anything or make anything public that they cannot explain scientifically. So because they couldn't explain any of this bizarre activity, a behavior of monoatomic gold, they couldn't explain it scientifically. None of this has ever been published. What you find is that when they had this pile of white fluffy powder inside an inert um, gas, a tube of gas, um, or in a tube of inert gas, should I say, and, and it was on a little pan that they put this. When, when he brought his hand up underneath it, the pile of white powder started to lift up and levitate, which suggests that we have monoatomic elements in our body, and it was reacting to the monoatomic elements being, being brought up, like bringing a magnet negative to negative, it rep, uh, repels it. So this is what seems to be happening, is that when we find this monoatomic substance, we can manipulate it with the energy in our own bodies. The, for me, one of the most important things that, we found, that David Hudson found is that between 700 and 800 degrees Celsius, this pile of white fluffy powder vanished from sight. This was a spectacular achievement because at one stage I thought it just became invisible. Now, we've already spoken about the fact that sound and resonance can make things invisible. Well, 700 degrees of Celsius is just a, a frequency. It's a resonance at a specific, at a very specific vibration. So at that specific resonance, um, the white fluffy powder disappears. They thought that it just disappeared from sight. So they, they wiped the pan clear, cleaned it, thinking that maybe they just disrupt it or disturb it. When they started bringing the temperature down, the pile of fluffy powder reemerged where it disappeared from. What this tells us, that between 700 and 800 degrees Celsius, monoatomic gold goes into a different dimension. And this is critical information to why the Anunnaki were obsessed with monoatomic gold and not the shiny metallic gold that most of us are obsessed with and that drives the global markets. And remember, this is why we've had such a long and inextricable history with gold becoming the major driving force of our economy in the world today. There are over 600 African mythologies that talk about the sky gods coming down to earth and doing a variety of things. The Zulu African tradition is a specifically interesting one because it comes from Southern Africa. And they refer to the sky gods as the Abalungu, who came down from the sky. And what did these Abalungu do? They created the humans. To do what? To be the slaves in the gold mines for the Anunnaki, for the gods. Zulu, the word Zulu, means people of the sky, very vaguely. It's got a far more deeper and more mysterious meaning, but for 
um, a lack of going into deep philosophical debates about the true meaning of the word. Let's stick to Zulu means people of the sky. Abalungu means pale sky gods, people that came from the sky. And there is a word for the Sumerian god Enki in Zulu. He is known as Enkai, the creator of the human race. Solomon is known as Shalumi and Abantu, or the Abantu people of Southern Africa, are referred to by Baba Kreda Mutwa as the children of Antu, as in Ab Antu. As we often do in English, the original people of Australia are called Ab original people to negate their, uh, their origins and who they truly are. And Baba Kreda Mutwa says that the children of Antu are the Abantu people, and they were called Abantu to negate the fact that they are the, actually the children of Antu. Well, who is Antu? Antu was the wife of Anu, the supreme Sumerian commander that came to earth, whose sons are Enlil and Enki took control of our planet. So there's a lot of very deep, mysterious African knowledge and philosophy that can be shared. And I suggest that you look into this and possibly look into some of my books where I expand more uh, detail into this particular part of human history. So let's turn to some more examples of more recent gold mining activity because we cannot escape this thing of mining gold in Southern Africa. In the late 1400s, I mentioned already that the Portuguese came around the Cape of Good Hope or the Cape of Storms and they come on shore and they meet the native people and they find many stone ruins. And some of them are spectacular, like this image here of Great Zimbabwe, where the walls are six meters wide and 10 meters high, clearly a very strong fortress for ancient cultures and ancient civilizations. When they asked the local people, whose land is this? They were told that this is the Terra dos Macomates. This is, in Portuguese, it means the land of the Makomati people. Well, we got to ask ourselves, who are the Makomati people? And the Makomati people are Dravidian gold miners that go back thousands of years, mining gold, trading with gold, and doing business between Southern Africa and Southern India. The Dravidians come from the southern part of India and Sri Lanka, and they are well known for their activities and, and trading with gold for thousands of years. From 700 AD, we have amazing stories from the island of Zanzibar, how Zanzibar was already doing business with the port of Sofala, um, doing business in gold, trading in gold. Well, where's the port of Sofala? Uh, if you don't know where Zanzibar is, Zanzibar is right between, it's a little island, which is also uh, has the uh, terrible history of uh, slavery, where slaves were exported from Africa into uh, the rest of the world. But Zanzibar uh, was a trading post for the, with the port of Sofala. Now, the port of Sofala is further down south on the coast of Mozambique. And it's a well-known port that did a lot of trade into the rest of the world. I didn't realize how important this part of southern Africa was. The Phoenicians did trade there, and pretty much all of the known world was trading with southern Africa from the port of Sofala. In the 11th century, Ahmed al-Biruni describes the prosperous gold exports from the port of Safala. And so we move on. And the gold was apparently a month's journey inland from the port of Safala. Well, what happens when you go a month's journey inland from the port of Safala? Remember, Safala is just south of the modern day town of Baira on the coast of Mozambique. If you go just south of that and you go inland, travel on foot and on horseback for a month through treacherous country with lions and other animals that want to eat you. Remember, this was a different time in human history. There were no roads or highways or, or uh, train tracks that'll take you there. So a month uh, tracking inland, where do you get to? You get to Masvingo in Zimbabwe. And that's where you find Great Zimbabwe ruins. And this is a spectacular bit of discovery. Great Zimbabwe, or the House of Stone. 
Great Zimbabwe itself has far more mysterious meanings than just house of stone, because encoded in the word Zimbabwe is Zimbabwe, Zimba, Simba, the lion, the roar of the lion is connected to sound, sound and resonance, and the ability to control, to control sound and resonance that is related to the roar of a lion and the manipulation of sound. There is so much ancient mystery encoded in all of this stuff that it could keep us busy for the rest of our lives trying to figure out how this mysterious stuff is encoded in our stories, the, the, uh, the ancient history that's, that's been handed down from, from civilization to civilization, and in the language that, is, that we use today, in the words and the structure of our sentences that we use, all of this stuff is deeply encoded in everything we do today. When we get to Great Zimbabwe, we also meet the Monomotapa Kingdom, the great golden kings that were never defeated. And these were the ancient Southern African kings. And actually the Monomotapa Kingdom stretched right across Southern Africa into Central Africa and into Zambia and Kenya and Tanzania. And uh, it was a huge kingdom that lasted for hundreds of years. And these were the guys that were providing the gold for the traders that came to the port of Safala. It's, f it's fascinating that the Monomotapa Kingdom is also connected further south, southwest of Great Zimbabwe. We find about 400 kilometers right on the border of modern day uh, Botswana, South Africa, and Zimbabwe. We find the famous um, ruins of Mapungubwe, uh, where there is now a big museum and the so-called ancestors of the great Zimbabwe ruins. Uh, I find that a very strange uh, coincidence because there's not much that suggests that in terms of ruins. And that we find that there's a much older civilization uh, that we find at Great Zimbabwe than at Mapungubwe. However, there is a connection to the Dravidian gold miners or the Makumati people. In some of these golden artifacts that were found uh, in the 30s, 1930s, specifically the golden rhino. And the reason why I suggest that this is connected to the Dravidians, because the golden rhino discovered at Mapungubwe only has one horn. Now, African rhinos have two horns. One-horned rhinos come from India. And this suggests that the Dravidians were active there, and this may most likely be some of their handiwork as they were trading and dealing in gold. So let's get back to the work in the Abzu and the Sumerian texts that talk about this place called the Abzu, where all the gold came from. There's some spectacular Sumerian translations that we get from Zachariah Sitchin. Now remember, he did not know about any of this when he was writing this stuff down. So what we're doing here is providing the physical evidence for much of his work. This translation is absolutely staggering. It says, in the Abzu, Enki plans was conceiving where to build his house, where for heroes, dwellings to prepare, where the bowels of the earth to enter, to mine the gold. Now, is there a ruin or an ancient stone structure that could possibly be seen as Enki's home or Enki's abode? And I suggest that Great Zimbabwe is exactly that place. You know, I grew up on the gold mines in South Africa, and it's fascinating because it's probably there that I discovered the fact that we could live without money. Because living on the gold mines, everything is provided to you for free. As long as you work in the gold mines, everything is for free. Your house is for free, your water is free, your electricity is free, your car is free, your petrol is free, your garden service is free. All the sporting facilities are laid on for free, the you know, five-star sporting facilities that you can imagine, and so it goes. As long as you work in the mine, all of this stuff is for free. And the mine manager always lives in the big white house on the hill. So whenever you get to one of these mining towns in South Africa, just, and you want to find the mine manager, just look around you and see the big white house on the highest hill, and that's inevitably the mine manager's house. And I suggest that Great Zimbabwe is this, since Enki was the founder of this vast gold mining empire. And Great Zimbabwe is by far the most impressive of all the ancient ruins and structures in Southern Africa. I suggest that maybe this is the mine manager's house 
the big white house on the hill. But there's a lot more to be said about Great Zimbabwe that we may get to in this series. So this is what Enki's house would look like from the air. And you see that very quickly it resembles the millions of stone structures and the stone circles in Southern Africa. Some of the most mysterious objects found at Great Zimbabwe were discovered and described by Theodore Bent in the late 1800s and very early 1900s. And these were the mysterious stone birds that can be linked to gold mining in Egypt and gold mining activity by the Anunnaki in Southern Africa. Uh, these stone birds are fascinating. They are very basic shapes. They're known as birds on pedestals. And they base, some of the most basic ones are just, is just an elongated stone that's got a wing, a wing carved into it and then a little eye at the top of the stone. And uh, normally the, the, the stone has got a, a, a rounded side that suggests that it's the head of the bird looking up the, at the sky with a bird, uh, the wing underneath, like in this particular um, image on the right hand side. That's a very good example of that. What we find is that these birds were most likely the guardians of the gold miners. And the reason I say this is because Theodore Bent in his uh, discoveries and his exploration in Egypt before he came to Southern Africa, he explored many gold mines and ancient mines in Egypt. And he found at the entrances to the mines carved out in the rock were these birds on pedestals, something like this. And, uh, and then they, they became famous statues and sculptures throughout Egypt. But he found these carvings of birds on pedestals um, into the entrances of these gold mines in Egypt. And when he discovered these stone birds on pedestals at Great Zimbabwe, I put two and two together and realized that we're most likely dealing with the original prototypes in the very old and ancient gold mines of Southern Africa, the Anunnaki gold mining empire. And this, these birds on pedestals, they were created as little mascots to protect the gold miners in these ancient mines and look up for protection uh, to the gods because they were known as gods that could fly, the winged beings or the feathered serpent that came down from the sky. So they, they were depicted as winged beings or bird-like beings and they would bring protection for the gold miners in these ancient gold mines. I found many similar uh, bird-shaped stones in the stone ruins of Southern Africa, which makes me think that um, the Zimbabwe birds are a much later version of these very basic bird-like shapes, which is a broad base and a narrow head and a neck that leads up to the head that looks up for protection from the gods in the sky. And suddenly these birds become giant monoliths and giant standing stones that have been carved out into the shapes of birds in a much larger fashion than just smaller, smaller statues. And this brings us to more Sumerian texts and translations and references to the gold mining empire of Anunnaki and Enki who established this in the Abzu or Southern Africa. Here is a fascinating translation. And this refers to possibly Enki's house and Enki's mines and the technology he used to create these gold mines and the tunnels and the mine shafts. It says, the earth splitter Enki there established, therewith in the earth a gash to make, by way of tunnels earth's innards to reach, the golden veins to uncover. It's very obvious what we're reading here, and it clearly refers to mining of gold on a large scale. But the Anunnaki were not getting enough gold out of the ground, and they needed help. So what did they do? They decided to clone a species, an Enki was the main architect and the main scientist behind this together what seems to be with what seems to be his sister and his son and Ninhursag and Ningizida and some other scientists around them, these Anunnaki, very, very smart individuals. And uh, if we have time in this series, we'll explore more about who the Anunnaki really are and the fact that they are very, very powerful beings. They're not just a bunch of guys that can fly around space and go from planet to planet. These individuals are far more powerful than meets the eye and that what we can imagine. Here is a translation once again uh, that we find in Sitchin's work referring to this gold mining activity and the creation of Adam and Adamu in Southern Africa. Let us create a Lulu, a primitive worker, 
the hardship work to take over, let the being, the toil of the Anunnaki carry on his back. And it continues where they decide to create the Adam or the first being as a slave. A primitive worker shall be created. Our command will he understand. Our tools he will handle. To the Anunnaki and the Abzu relief shall come. Over and over again, we hear about the Abzu, the gold mining, and a primitive worker that needs to be brought into existence to help the Anunnaki get more gold out of the ground. So, what kind of tools and technology did Enki and the Anunnaki use? We're going to get to those in the next episode. I'm Michael Tellinger. Thanks for watching. As we can see, from the moment the Anunnaki set foot upon our once primitive planet, the race was on to procure mass amounts of gold and hold as much power over the emerging human population as possible. The Archive recommends checking out the entire series on Gaia by clicking the link in the description. Make sure to take advantage of the free 7-day trial by signing up today.